This is the Free Heal Life Podcast, episode number 51. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Heal Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. And uh, now we're over the crest, everyone. We're into 51 and past the 50 mark. And I couldn't be more excited. We've got a ton of great guests coming up in the future. And the ski resorts are just about to open. People are shredding pow here in uh, Utah as it were. So <laughs> I don't know how much of a base is actually underneath there, but people are getting after it. And, uh, that always gets us super fired up. So, uh, newsroom and notes today, mostly stuff going on in the shop. Uh, opening days, like I said, are coming at a lot of ski resorts. Some are already open. Uh, I know here in Utah, we're, uh, not far away, a couple weeks and we can see it in the shop. The tech shop is in full swing right now. We're mounting a bunch of skis, tuning skis, cutting skins, doing repairs on bindings, all the good stuff. So especially if you're in Utah and you need to get some work done, you can drop your stuff by and uh, we're pushing hard to get stuff ready for opening day. Uh, if you're from out of town, uh, anytime you buy stuff from us, uh, especially if you're doing like ski binding combos, uh, we're always happy to do the mounts in house, uh, and get that done for you. So some people actually have sent us stuff to do and then mail it back to them. So that's, that's happened as well too. Either way, we want to be your preferred shop. We want to help you out and whatever we can do, let us know. Uh, one thing we added to the website this week is our Telemark packages. So there's some pre-made packages on there uh, with some skis, boots, and bindings. Uh, some of those are from uh, some of the guys in the shop, and we'll be doing more of that combos that we like and putting them together. If you don't see one of those pre-made packages that fits your needs, uh, we can put packages together and save you a little bit of money as well. So be sure to reach out on the website and you can find those. Last but not least, our mailing list. I'm going to start keeping this in the notes of the podcast. This is extra, extra crucial. We want to have you guys sign up for our mailing list. It comes out once a week. We have a ton of content from, uh, basically we just aggregates a bunch of the content that's coming out from Telemark Skier Magazine, Free Hill Life Shop, and whatever else we're doing, special deals, things that uh, may be coming up that we let our mailing list know about beforehand that we do not uh, tell everyone else out there, but we would love for you guys to opt into that so that we can have better communication with you. Uh, like I said, it's once a week. We don't overuse it. We don't share it with anybody, and it's our way of staying connected with you and hopefully being the most badass telemark shop on the planet and help you out and stay in touch so that's our newsroom and notes for today uh, my guest today was the 2008 u.s telemark extreme junior champion he was the 2012 grand targi extremes sick bird award recipient he's a two-time teva mountain games big air podium winner and he's been featured in multiple full-length Telemark ski films over the years. He's also been the photo editor at Telemark Skier Magazine, associate photo editor at Ski and Skiing Magazine, photo editor at Free Skier Magazine, K2 Ski's team manager, and Moonlight Mountain Gear marketing manager. So please welcome my good friend, Shell Ellison. Shell Ellison, welcome to the Free Heal Life Podcast. How's it going, buddy? What's up, Josh? How's it going? <laughs> good, good, man. Uh, I'm psyched you're doing this. You're you're like we were just saying, I've known you for 16 years, which is absolutely nuts. <laughs> yeah, that is crazy. And I'm I'm really psyched that, that you wanted to do this because I feel like here I am still doing telework stuff <laughs> all these years later. And I feel like a lot of cool cats like you like have helped me along the way but i haven't had a chance to have a lot of you guys on the podcast and i thought your uh thought your little journey was pretty uh pretty interesting to talk about so thanks for being here yeah for sure of course yeah always good to hear from you um so just to kind of where 
I guess where where are you? T- I I, I want to get like a little backstory here to kind of help people kind of flesh out the idea of like where you're from and stuff. But where where are you living right now? That's that's the most interesting part to me, and and I love it because <laughs> you're you're kind of like me. I don't I I don't necessarily have to be like right next to the mountains, but um yeah, you're uh, you're living in the Midwest these days, right? That is correct. I live just outside Minneapolis, actually. That's awesome. And you got you got some fa- family history there, right? I do. My dad's from Wisconsin. Um, it's a, it's a, obviously a skiing mecca, if you know JT Robinson. But um, <laughs> no, my dad's from Wisconsin. Go Packers. And uh, so, yeah, a lot of family still around the Midwest. Can you say that when you live in mi- Minnesota now? I don't think that's allowed, right? That's like big rivalry. Well, you know, when they're at the bottom of the division, they can uh, they can take it. <laughs> I don't even follow football. So Vikings are doing terrible and Packers are not. Yes. Gotcha. Gotcha. That's correct. (laughs) So you're stoked. (laughs) That's funny. I didn't even think about that because that isn't that, that is like the main rivalry there for football, right? Um, it's usually Packers bears, Packers bears, but there's also, you know, the Vikings like to feel like they need a rivalry with us as well. So, that's good. <laughs> Sorry for all you Midwest football fans out there. I obviously have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> or people that don't like football at all. They're like, oh, I want to listen to this ski podcast. Oh, it's about American football. <laughs> T- typical. Like, has nothing to do yeah. with it. So it's our clickbait. We actually just wanted to talk <laughs> about Midwest sports. So, oh, that's funny. Um, well, yeah, living in the Midwest, but you're a. Uh, um, you're originally from Vail. You you were born in Vail, weren't you? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So give me give me a little rundown. I mean, you uh that's kind of where I met you. I mean, I met you when you were at the Vail Mountain School. Yep. 16 years ago, I guess. So which is which yeah. is crazy, but yeah, I mean, give me, give us a little rundown. Like you're you're from Vail. I you come your family is like you I mean, your brother, your dad like Mount, mom you guys are like mountain people so um. for sure yeah um so my parents met in Vail a long time ago as a couple of ski bums and had my brother and i there um i think they lived there since the early 80s maybe and then bought a house mid 80s they bought their house in Vail for, I think it was $90,000, oh which is <laughs> a hilarious price now, if you know Vail. Um, but yeah, so um, kind of how I started getting into just skiing in general is my dad and my mom were both into skiing. And then, um, you know, went through club programs growing up. I started racing kind of, I was kind of following my brother for a while. He was a race, a a downhill racer. Um, and then I thought this is boring and I started uh, doing moguls. And then I thought, Oh, I love the jumping, but not so much the moguls. So then I switched to like a freestyle program. And then the reason I started telemarking is because the school I went to Vail mountain school you could get out of school early if you were on a winter sports team. And so my options were, um, downhill racing, cross country skiing, or the telemark team. And I thought the lesser of the three (laughs) evils was telemark skiing, which is hilarious now, because obviously I love telemark skiing, but at the time, I was like, oh, okay, this is the lesser of the three evils. I'll try telemark skiing. So it was really just to get out of school. (laughs) That's how this all started. (laughs) I know everyone kind of has a weird story, but um, yeah, that's how I started. And then obviously my mentality on it changed pretty quickly. That's so funny. I had no, I didn't know that. I, cause I, uh, I guess had that program been around for a while, it was Mike Ioli was the one that started it, wasn't it? Yeah. He actually, two of my brother's friends. So my brother's four years older than I am. And two of my brother's friends convinced Michael Ioli or Mr. Ioli, as I was used to calling him. Um, they convinced him to kind of start a more structured team. And yeah, so that was, I think two or three years before I, you know, was in high school there. So, 
it was it had a little bit of structure when we got there and then by the time that i had graduated it i think there was almost like 40 kids on the team at, when i when i graduated so jeez yeah that was a really big team shout out to your brother too he's a, yeah oh, oh. sylvan ellison sylvan El- <laughs> yeah sylvan ellison who's like an incredible nordic skier too so if you're a, a nordy he uh yeah you got some free free heel blood i love it for sure yeah. yeah, he's a he's a cross country national champion. So yep, yep, that's that's so cool, man. I love that. Well, I yeah, and I guess yeah, when I met you, I mean that was kind of at, at the height of that thing because I remember meeting you guys in a parking lot of all places. I don't even remember. I think it was Mike Ioli. I bumped into and I saw all you kids walking around with telly skis, and I'm like, who? Like, I, it was. I don't know if I was there for like the U.S. Open or something. Uh, um. I yeah, I don't. I don't remember what it was because I think the the first time that we really got connected was when you ran um, that freehilllife dot com forum. Oh yeah, the cable dude. We're bringing that back actually, which is hilarious. Oh, the cable. Yeah, that's exactly <laughs> what I was thinking of. Okay, and then you had that post out about making like an amateur ski team. Yep. The um the monster squad. It, Your favorite name. I get and. <laughs> Well, I get the reference now that I'm older, but when I was younger, I was like, that is such a stupid name. I, rem- I remember but- being like dev- <laughs> devastated because like you hated the name. And I remember being like, <laughs> I'm like, Shell hates the name. And I felt like this old guy that like wasn't cool. I'm like, making stupid names up and you were like, what is this monster squad thing? That's so dumb. <laughs> 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 well, now that I'm older, I get the reference, but you know, when you're 14, I think you're a little on edge. Um, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. Well, I, and then I made like a little sponsor me tape from, uh, just some telemarking that I had done in the park, which probably looking back on it is not very good, but, um, yeah, then kind of submitted it and heard from you, which, I know that team went through its ups and downs pretty quickly, but um, it was definitely my introduction to you and um, kind of the telemark industry for sure. Yeah, that was a fun a fun thing. Yeah, what he's talking about is this. Yeah, so I, I at the time, uh, I was shooting movies with the Powder Horse. So we did PWO5 and PWO6. And uh, I had kind of pitched it to those guys. I said, hey, I've got freehilllife.com was like a, I, I would try to make it like a web magazine. And then we had this forum called the cable and there was all these part kids like from all over the place, Shell being one of them. And, uh, yeah, I was like, well, let's start this little am team. And I went to my ski sponsors at the time and like volet. And I put that little package together and yeah, I threw it out there. I said, send edits in. And I, it, it was kind of funny because basically almost everyone that sent, something in pretty much was like on the team so to speak so <laughs> yeah uh, but it but it was actually a really cool group of people and originally you guys were supposed to do a uh i had talked to noah and jonah howell from the powder whores i don't know if you even knew this but basically you guys were supposed to be in the next powder horror movie and yeah we were supposed to like get a segment as like a group exactly yeah and I got all you guys, your stuff. And then basically powder horse called me up and bailed on it. And they were like, no, like, we're not going to do this. We're not interested in a bunch of like little park rat kids and whatever. And (laughs) I was like super bummed. So I, yeah. So I basically called Cody Smith and who was a friend of mine that we did some other ski stuff and said, Hey, let's start this movie company. And we, we started lipstick films and that's kind of where, all, everybody in that funny mo- little movie we made since we last spoke was basically the Monster Squad kids. So there's a little yeah. little history for you. But yeah, you were young. How I Lipstick mean, Films was born. Yeah, uh, I was 14 at the time. So so funny. I I still remember like like when we did that that tour and we <laughs> like I still I remember being so worried because I felt like it was just like we came to Vail mountain school on that when we came through Colorado on the movie tour. And I just remember being like, Oh man, I can't leave shell with like all these other kids. Cause they're like trying to, they're like rolling deep drinking and you guys are like 14 and I'm like, Oh man, I'm like, this is not good. <laughs> I was just like, this is, this is oh, bad. the other athletes. Yeah, yeah totally. Like, like, yeah, for sure. Jeff Rakowski and, uh, oh, like, <laughs> 
so, yeah austin Corey was there as well totally yeah oh, that's so funny. cody and yeah that's funny well so like yeah i mean that was kind of and and back then i mean that is funny because i have your original resume somewhere like you i think you were 14 oh and, boy oh yeah no for sure dude i keep all that stuff and you had like you had like taken some so honestly they were like self like you had you're into photography remember that and there was like some bed like you took a picture of you i don't maybe you don't even remember oh, this yeah no i know we, that's the first camera it was a film camera and i was doing uh I used to ride the bus, the town bus, not the school bus, uh, to and from school. And I was on my way home and I was taking like uh, time lapse photography with me standing in it. I totally know what you're talking about. Yeah, it had all the yeah, it had all the kind of lights, you know, because when you time lapsed it, it had like the lights all swirling around you and you were just standing there. Right. That's so funny. <laughs> I gotta yep. I'll have to see if I can find some of those. But uh <laughs> Yeah. Um yeah, that was a cool time, man. I mean, Telemark Park skiing was pretty kind of, I mean, you think about it, that was like 2006-ish, somewhere in there. Yeah, so, yep. I mean, it was it was different, right? Like, it, it seemed like it was, it just was a different time. I mean, t- people skiing in the park was still pretty new, but I don't know. What do you what do you remember of that time? I mean, you were pretty young, but I mean... Was yeah, it, it was... Um, you know, it was still a time when like the big five brands or at least a couple of them had, you know, like Telemark sections, like how there was K2 Telemark and then Rossignol had a Telemark team. And um, I feel like it had a little more like mainstream support then. Not not that it doesn't have, because I mean, I think it might almost be better now that every company that makes telemark products or sponsors telemark athletes is almost purely a telemark company so i mean you can debate here or there but um yeah it was still a time when there was a little bit more money pumped into it by the mainstream uh the mainstream ski industry yeah no that's that's a good point i guess i kind of like like didn't Ben Dolans have like a Nike ACG contract at some For point? For sure. Yeah, no. And that's as funny. I was thinking it like that time, that era was so different in that sense because Nike had, yeah, ACG, which was like this outerwear brand at the time. And they sponsored Ben Dolans and Sarah Clemenson. And I remember all of us that were like, you know, we're, we're sponsored athletes, AKA people gave us free shit basically. Like it wasn't like, right. <laughs> I mean, that yeah. really, that's really what it is. <laughs> And, but these guys were making money. And I remember all of us right. just being like, how did you guys do this? <laughs> yeah. Wait, uh, you get, you're getting paid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That was a, that was a pretty amazing, interesting time, but that's, that's true. Like when you, I guess when you got into it, yeah. Cause we had kind of through that lipstick film era, we kind of hooked, uh, kind of hooked up with Rosignol during that time. And so, mm-hmm. A bunch of us had Rosignol Telemark stuff, which was, you know, like I've talked in our gear podcast. It was basically like top sheets on a different Alpine ski for the most part. Um, right. But uh, yeah, there was more support and more visibility and you could buy it at retail. So I guess that was kind of a different, different era that way. Yeah, because there was a couple of us that went on... I, th- I think mostly through your bargaining, but there was a couple of, of us that went on to Rosinol Telemark from f- after that movie, after since we last spoke. Yeah. Because I know then Sean, or was Sean already on Rosinol? Sean Raskin? Yeah, I think Sean was. But yeah, we were, it was kind of that group. Like, I think I, I was trying to wheel and deal it like where we all were on like one brand, which is totally. Oh, Yeah. That's totally like how I was trying to think about it. I'm like, look, Rosignol, if we're all on the same brand, there's more value to you to have a movie of all. Yeah, of us. <laughs> they only get one option. <laughs> I think Jeff Rakowski was also on Rosignol, <laughs> which is funny. <laughs> oh man, yeah, that's funny yeah. to think about. Uh, anyways, if you haven't yep. seen that movie, it's not. It's on YouTube. It's really, I, I, it, it was a fun time. It probably could be like half the length because i talk too much in that whole thing <laughs> but there's some there's some fun skiing in there for sure yeah and you're yeah, like you have a neon trees song in there who like after that absolutely blew up 
Oh, I forgot about. Yeah, actually, that's funny. Uh, yeah, because I used to always use Salt Lake Music, and yeah. I forgot that that was in there. Uh, yeah, Neon Trees. There's a couple songs. There was another band in there. Little music trivia: the drummer that's now the Neon Trees drummer, she was in a band called Another Statistic, which is a couple songs in that movie as well. So yeah, yeah. I don't know. Did you ever come? Oh, you're probably too young. We used to do the Free Hill Life Fall Ball at hard rock cafe because i was waiting tables there and uh i was the poster boy one year but i never got to go you never got to go yeah okay yeah yeah but i think i was too young because it was probably it was probably hopefully 21 and up it, it was 20, but i was like yeah. 15 or 16 at the time that's right yeah you wouldn't have been out we and it was in salt lake but yeah we used to host these like fall kickoff parties and they were rad i mean we had tons of people and um raffles and whatever but that's funny uh neon trees played two years of that and i honestly it's funny i think i paid him maybe like 150 bucks to play those yeah to play those things so yeah I and for- now they're like a huge band <laughs> that's so <laughs> just cool. hilarious i forgot about that yeah good old neon trees wow that's funny um well, yeah. So yeah, we did that lipstick era. And I remember, I mean, you were already kind of interested in photography at that point. I'm right. I don't know. I feel like looking back where you already, th- you were shooting photos and stuff already kind of through high school, right? Yeah, I didn't, I don't, I didn't get a digital camera until maybe like junior or senior year of high school. But, um, yeah, I was, I was getting into it. And actually my first published photo is of you doing a mute 360 in Grizzly Gulch. Me doing it. And you sold it to like yeah, and you sold it to like a Polish ski oh magazine. Oh my god. It was a Czech ski magazine, dude. Oh a Czech, yeah, yeah. And so that that was my intro and I was like, whoa, I could have my my photos in magazines. I, I need to do more of this. Oh my gosh. I totally forgot about that. That's funny. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I remember that. Yeah. We built that one jump from across the, uh, across Grizzly Gulch and, uh, up across from Alta. That's so funny. And I remember, I yeah, kind of like the power line area. Yeah, totally. Yeah. It's, fu- yep. it's funny thinking back to that now. Cause like that area, like it, you wouldn't, I mean, there'd be people up there, but now man, like, there's lines of people walking up that. Oh yeah. It's insane. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's funny. I forgot about that getting published in that. And I, I feel like I met somebody from that magazine, like in, uh, probably was like stew by at the free heel, free healer opening or something like that. Anyways. Okay. I was, I was just trying to think, I'm like, how did that even happen? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so you had that published, and you were oh, in that whole era, like through high school. I mean, basically, you were getting free gear, and you were skiing and shooting photos and edits, and um, yeah, doing that. Kind I of was thing. Uh, I was skiing for Rosinal still through high school, because I think my um, sorry, I think my relationship with them continued on a little bit past some of other people's that were also on them but um yeah i mean i was making edits with my friends and shooting photos of them and just kind of trying to yeah just have more action photos and and ski edits and that was just kind of my thing i also obviously love to ski and be on the other side of the camera but i think i was the one to kind of in my friend group that was the most willing to you know take the time to shoot photos or video and edit it all together so which a lot of people if if you haven't done that a a lot of uh, ski ski photography is not for the faint of heart that like you want to just sit around like it's a lot of sitting around right you're not yeah i mean it it depends but yeah it's a lot of hurry up and wait as i like to call it yeah totally and what and and uh before the before the, any of you that have a have a girlfriend um you're very familiar with this concept <laughs> ouch <laughs> oh that's funny man you're gonna get in trouble for that one for sure that's all right uh 
Well, you were, you know, before we hopped on the on the call to, or before we hopped on the podcast, we were you mentioned uh, Crested Butte, and I I was thinking too, you were you were part of that big mountain competition era as well. I mean, you weren't just a park skier; you're like a great telemark skier. So you were doing these big mountain comps. I mean, tell people what that was like because it. I, we've we. I was just talking to. I don't. Do you know Tim Shepard? We just had him on. I do. Yeah. I, I actually just listened to that podcast yesterday. Oh, cool. Yeah. Tim's rad. And I, yeah. you kind of predated him a little bit in that scene, but yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, even him, we were talking about how the competitions were like super prevalent. I mean, there was like a bunch of them and all you kids used to all this, the Colorado Rocky mountain school, Vail mountain school, you guys all went to those and would compete against each other. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was actually I think the first the first big mountain comp I did was the Crest of Butte Extremes in I want to say 2015. How was it that? And late? I was. Well, let's see. No, no, it had. When did I graduate college or uh, high school? 2016, I think. No, no, whoa, 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 whoa. 2000. <laughs> My mind's all scrambled. Uh, 2009, I graduated high school. So it must have been 2005, 2006, I did my first big mountain comp. I was way off. Yeah, you were like 10 years off. I'm like, what are you talking yeah. about? <laughs> it's still morning here. That's, that's um, all good. It's all good. Anyways, yeah, that was the first. And I think I ended up getting fourth my first year doing it. Also was my first year telemark skiing. Really? Oh, that's And so funny. I was, I was like, oh, this is awesome. Like, you know, it, it, it feeds my adrenaline. I'm seem to be doing decently well. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to keep doing this. And I, I think that was the years when there was also a telecomp in Alpine Meadows, which I know that's, I don't think my school team traveled to those. Um, and then, you know, eventually that was canceled forever. And then Targi became more of a thing. And, um, but I think Targi, I've only competed there twice. And once I felt like I put together a sweet run and I felt like I just got screwed. So (laughs) I remember going back the next year and thinking like, I'm not going to win this unless I do something that other people aren't doing. And so I backflipped off the top cornice. Oh, yeah. Maybe. Um, and landed on my feet, but then class did a classic telly roll over the front and, you know, landed the rest of my run. But I did go head over feet, which is um, a big score deduction for those of you that are not familiar. Um, <laughs> but I did, win, I did win the sick bird for that. Oh, sweet. I for- oh, yeah. That so, was sick bird. I forgot about that award. Consolation. I think I ended up getting like. 10th or 11th or not, something not that good but cool. um yeah and that's kind of when i was like um i'm just kind of finished competing in terms of big mountain yeah those but, com- those competitions are hard i mean honestly like like you said you felt like you got screwed i feel like everyone who's done one of those feels like they got screwed oh yeah for sure <laughs> and i mean not that i didn't have my successes i think i i won the junior national championship in crest de butte in 2009 i think so i mean obviously i was pleased with that and i love those competitions because not only does it you know feed my adrenaline and give me gratification but it's also if you've never been to one of those events the vibe is just unreal not only because it's a ski competition and generally skiers are fun to be around but the telemark competitions are even better because you know when you're in the athletes meeting beforehand everyone every you know someone will walk in with a six pack and or a 12 pack of pbr and just kind of pass them out around the table like oh hey you know haven't seen you in two years oh haven't seen you in three years have a beer and you know then after the athlete meeting everyone's in the hot tub getting drunk the day before the competition (laughs) and it's 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 a rad time yeah i it it really does seem like something something about those competitions is 
it was really more of like a gathering point. Like you said, like someone wouldn't see you for a couple of years or it was like an annual thing, you know, yeah. it, it almost seemed over the years, it almost seemed like that was the most important part of it is less. I don't know. I mean, there's always a couple people that are super gun ho about crushing the competition, but overall it always seemed like it was more like a gathering point for being there with other telemark skiers. I mean, would you agree with that? Yeah, for sure. Um, and I, even the people that did super well in them always, you know, like Jake Saxon, he was always having a rip and roaring good time too. So it, I feel like it wasn't, there wasn't one person who took it too serious where everyone's like, Oh yeah, don't talk to him before the competition. But, um, yeah, it was, yeah, it was always a good time. Yeah, no, that's cool. It just, I was thinking like, so after you get kind of started doing that competition stuff, I was thinking after you, when you were more in college, that was probably when you were still shooting some edits and stuff. That was more like when, uh, Teva mountain games was happening, right? That was like later on. Yeah. But I guess that was more yeah, like 2012, that, right? Yeah. 2011 or 12 is when I traveled around with you, um, that winter in the van oh. with the Rodafella demo fleet. That's right. You know what? I, that and just now it's Paul as well. Totally. You know what that just reminded me of is uh, <laughs> I forgot about this. That's right. I forgot we did that that winter where we traveled around. That would have been. I was trying to think. Was that the loyalty tour? Probably loyalty. Yeah. The, that movie because I remember we. I was like, Shell, you should come on the tour or and do the demo tour after. And we, I went. I had to go to the junkyard. So I have this E350 van at the time. It's white. I don't even did it have the low. It didn't. No have, windows. No windows. Uh, it like it's candy like, snatchers. <laughs> it is definitely. And back then, like it wasn't that cool to live in your van. By the way, I don't think like van ha, <laughs> hashtag van life hadn't quite happened yet. It was more like hashtag down by the river because everyone always yeah. talks shit they're like oh you live in your van like down by the river and i'm like oh my so how many times am i gonna hear this this is crazy um but yeah you were still pretty young and i remember like you were coming on tour or on to do that demo tour but i didn't have a back seat remember and yes i i barely <laughs> i remember this very clearly <laughs> no back seat and I remember I had to call my buddy Gaddis and I was like, I got to put a back seat in this thing. And we went to the, ju I, or I did, I don't, I don't remember. I don't think you were there, but we went to the junkyard and I found another E350 with a back seat in it. And we took it out and welded a seat in and welded a seatbelt in so that you would have a safe, <laughs> kind of safe driving uh, in that van for that winter. That's crazy. Yep. Yep. You didn't see a lot of scenery back there, did you? Because you, the windows were blacked out. Yeah, that sounds and, terrible. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I was I was kind of editing, you know, photos or videos from our last stop beforehand because I know we started in Salt Lake and filmed a bit with Tony Gill, and then we went, I think, to like Mount Bachelor and did a tour stop there. And then up to Mount Baker, and then we came back and uh, spent some time with Jarl Berg at um, what's that Oregon mountain that has the Telefest? Mount Hoodoo. Yeah, Mount Hoodoo. Yep, we yep. did we did that the Telefest there, and then I then maybe went to Targi after. I can't remember exactly after that, but it was kind of like we would go do a movie showing, also demo telemark gear and then you know spend a couple more days filming for next year's movie and then we'd move on to the next oh the God. next spot that's so uh, yeah wow i that's 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 cool to hear you say that because i totally forgot some of that i forgot about the demos the demo tours for some reason i must have like blacked yeah. it out <laughs> oh actually funny story that we do have to bring up because uh I ha is this I the U-Haul story? Yeah, I just remembered that, that you were there for that. <laughs> yeah. So, so for anybody out there that thinks volet straps are like the best thing since sliced bread, um, yeah, so yeah, me, Alex, Paul, and Shell, we're driving down from Mount Hood. So we're pulling this U-Haul trailer with all the NTN gear, and we're coming down from 
uh, Mount Hood, kind of up in that area, coming into Gresham, Oregon. And we were already in town and kind of cruising along that main street. And all of a sudden, remember it just like the the van yeah, just we just jerked. Heard scratching. Yeah, it yeah. just jerked. And all of a sudden it was like, like, you know, scratching. And what had happened is I had to go on this demo tour, I needed to put a, 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 a hitch on the back of my van. And what had happened is the ball had unthreaded underneath and we hit a bump. And when we hit the bump, the whole ball came out in the trailer section <laughs> and the chains, you have like the chains that go to your, go to your truck or whatever your van. And so literally it, the, you remember that big, like, uh, uh, like the bolt portion of the ball basically was dragging through the pavement with the chains yeah. holding it to the van. <laughs> yeah. We like all hop out and we're like, holy shit. Like the van just like was dragging this trailer and there's like a, there's literally like a router line of like going through the pavement and uh, yeah, the three of us in the middle of traffic put it back on and then grabbed as many volet straps as we could and we strapped it back to the van so we could drive it to a u-haul i forgot yeah. about that that was a wild one dude. and it, we drove it pretty far like it was i was impressed you know those volley straps have always been amazing but i was thoroughly impressed at that point i'll have to see if i can dig up the photo of that that is that was actually pretty funny <laughs> i'm really yeah. i'm really glad that we that didn't happen i always think about that had that happened driving down that pass oh man oh, that could have made us crash for sure <laughs> yeah we might not be here today that might have been a little yeah. bit a little bit scarier oh man yeah you had some adventures man i i uh the the guys working at the shop these days it's we still have that van which is ridiculous it has like two hundred fifty thousand miles on it now and uh wow it's even creepier dude it's like spray painted black and um but yeah i'm always giving the guys a hard time at the shop because they're like, I don't know if we want to drive this thing. Like maybe we should get it like checked out. And I'm like, you guys need to harden it up a little bit. You know? <laughs> yeah. All right. Millennials. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, I need to, I need to have you give them like or a Gen Z. I should say <laughs> you need to, we need to give it like, go back to you guys and have you guys give them like pep talks about like, look, this is, this has been done. You're all right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Look, kids, OSHA, never heard of them. <laughs> Safety measures, seatbelts, come on. No. Yeah. That's funny. Um, God, that you've been through some... Thank you for hanging out with me, man. I don't know. <laughs> I yeah, feel like you've been through course. some stuff, man. That that and uh, that thing and then the, uh, the, the Norway trip, honestly... <laughs> that we went on. Oh, I'd have not told, I don't think I've told this story, but that's, I would, that was a funny one because you, you talked about Targhee, but I think that might've been almost the same time. Cause remember you and I drove overnight from grand Targhee and Wyoming. And then yep. we literally ditched the bags in a parking lot, a ch uh, church parking lot at like four in the morning, mm -hmm. swapped bags, picked up Kate Horahan and then we flew to Norway. Yep. And that was around that same. Met JT Robinson. Yep. Met JT Robinson there. And who else was on that? You, me, JT, Kate. Was that it? Yep. That was it. Yep. Because we had a uh, three-person van for four people. Yeah. You want? Do you want to explain this one? <laughs> I, I. It actually, it'd be funny to hear your perspective. Yeah, sure. Because I, mean, I was like. We... <laughs> Go for yeah, it. Go <laughs> I for remember it. you being a little bit mad at me because we show up at the airport at Gardamon in Oslo and you've rented a van, which is decently size, you know, um, the, the on the hood, the company is called Rent a Wreck. <laughs> and so first of all, we're like, OK, um, it is it's more of a cargo van. So it has three seats in the cabin up front. But then there's a, a metal wall with a glass window, and then the, there's the rest of the van, which is like a cargo van. It's it's not heated in the back. There's just a floor to slide things in on. But there's only three seats in the front, and there's four of us. 
And I remember uh, me being like the snarky, smart ass teenager is like you rented a three person van for four people. <laughs> and you're like, it said three passengers. So I thought like the driver and three passengers and like me probably made another comment back. Like, are you kidding me, man? But anyways, it worked out and being pretty funny because we would rotate who would lay who would put all their ski gear on and lay in the back with the ski bags. Uh, and I, I, we'd like bring a pillow. And I remember Kate Horahan napping quite a bit back there. Like literally laying we driving, on ski bags. Like, yeah. While we were driving between Oslo and Telemark where we were going to film and stay and all that stuff. Oh my. Yeah. I, I, it's funny. I think back to that. I was kind of pissed, but I was, I, I took it too personally. Cause I'm thinking, like back then I was like, you know, I'm here, I'm trying to organize all this. And I vividly remember someone told me about this rent a rec company because I, I was like, Norway, this is going to be su- anybody that's traveled in Norway knows it's expensive, you know? So I was like, oh yeah, four of us are going to go to Norway and we're going to rent this van and the specs on the van on the website, it was definitely cheaper but the way that it looked like the layout of the van, I for sure thought it had like a back seat, not a cargo. So yeah, I was probably embarrassed and you were probably razzing me pretty good too. I, like, <laughs> yeah. and, and I was really nervous because when we got there, remember, like I couldn't figure out where the key, like I, I remember specifically going to the rental counter, you know, like you, you're going to pick a rental car up. And I said, oh, yeah. I said, Hey, I'm, I'm here to get a rent a wreck. And they like looked at me like, uh, I, I think you need to go to the, the lost and found. And I was like, what? And then I told, I think I told you guys and you guys were like, Oh man, whatever. And so literally <laughs> the keys were left with the attendant at the lost and found in the airport in Oslo. And then the, and then we, in the van there, the van was, and also key key component of that is yes totally unsafe that we had a person laying in the back and you remember like if someone had to pee they'd have to like knock on the window and be like hey pull over like you couldn't actually yeah. you like you couldn't hear the person because it was a window it was like a legit and cargo that, van i'm remembering this now it was also rear wheel drive and and i was just going to mention they did not put the chains in the van like they were supposed to yeah be. Yeah, we had to buy chains. Yeah. <laughs> that trip was epic. So, yeah, so we leave Oslo. I'm embarrassed as hell because I bring all of you guys and I'm trying to like be like, yeah, we're in Norway. And here you guys are in like, you know, a rent a wreck van, cargo van, <laughs> freeze. You know, you had to fully clothe yourself in your ski gear to lay in the back, which is insane. And then, yeah, and then it snowed. Remember, the weather was so bad in the rear wheel drive, and we didn't have chains for the first <laughs> section of it. <laughs> and uh, Yes. Uh, we ended up getting chains later, but that was after. Remember, we got stuck in Morgadal after mm-hmm. going, hanging out with the Pol- the the crew from Poland. <laughs> yeah, Maciek. Yep, exactly. Magic, man. Yep. Shout out to Magic and the Polish uh, Telemark skiers. Um, and you and I bought another Volé strap story is remember you and I drove from Morgadal to find chains and we went to that little gas station or whatever and nobody mm-hmm. really spoke English and we didn't know how to measure the tires and we just bought whatever and they didn't fit after we got oh, them. Yeah, we, they were too big. So we had to Volé strap the, <laughs> uh, the cha- I forgot about that. Yeah. So the rest of the trip, we Volé strapped the chains onto the van tires oh dude what a trip that was pretty rad though we uh yeah ski we stayed in sondre norheim's house we skied there we went to veerly skied the park at veerly uh skied Gauss we went with uh yeah we went with torstein from Rodafella to gauss to topen that was a good trip yeah man. we did we did like a free healer skier cross as well in Morgan all. Oh yeah. Do you remember that? Totally. Yeah. No, I do remember that. They had yeah. that little race. That was fun, man. Did you? Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you have Norwegian roots. I mean, was it cool for you to go back and check that out? 
That was actually the first time I had ever been to Norway was when we went. Um, I have since been back many times. I've lived there, um, lived there for about two years, but, um, yeah, that was kind of my first exposure to Norway and it was quite the trip, not only cause my family roots are actually from the Telemark region. Um, but just obviously being exposed to the Norwegian ski culture. And then, um, I don't know if you remember, we drove overnight to the ramen and watched my brother in oh, the yeah. cross country world cup. That's when, uh, is it Kieran? No. What's her, uh, Keegan, 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 Keegan Randall, yep. right? Is that right? Yep. Yep. Didn't she yep. win? What she, she, won. Oh, yeah, she did. She won the woman's, the women's sprint. Oh, and yeah. uh my brother was not quite the sprinter. I remember he didn't make finals, but um no, it was that was the only time I've seen my brother ski on the World Cup, so that was an amazing trip. Um but yeah, it was just kind of my whole exposure to that Norwegian ski culture and then you know, even 10 years later when I saw Torstein at ispo in munich he's like oh hey shell you know it's like immediate connection and um and i think he's now the ceo of Rodafello, which is awesome um but yeah it's that was an amazing trip and one i will definitely never forget yeah that was rad yeah and Rodafello actually just moved outside of Drammen. uh funny yeah. enough so wow yeah that's crazy uh I love that. I'm, this is why I wanted you on, man. Memory lane. I'm remembering stuff yeah, that I totally forgot for about. Sure. Well, I one I, one thing I wanted to get into is is, is uh, I mean, we had a lot of ski adventures over the years. I, I, w- the thing I thought was so cool is making making a living in skiing. I mean, like we were joking about being a sponsored skier. I mean, for any of you young kids out there, like being a sponsored skier is like you got to think about it more like you're an artist and someone gave you like paint. It's not like you're going to make a million bucks. You know what I mean? So, uh, but one thing I think it was cool about you is you went to school down in Boulder and then, um, you ended up really making a cool career, you know, for a number of years in the ski business, not like obviously just skiing, but, um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you ended up. What was it? Was it a photography major that you did at CU? It was, yeah. So, kind of as I was getting to my later years, well, I guess I was helping you and Cody and Tony Gill and Kate and JT at Tell when you acquired Telemark Skier Magazine. Um, but yeah, I was kind of at the point where I was trying to be a professional athlete and because i started getting paid by other companies but it was not only because of my skiing and my exposure but um i was you know providing them with content and that's kind of right as social media was becoming of importance to brands and companies so you know i would wear their their gear and kind of promote it and do what they need me to do, but also providing them with content for their catalogs and social media and things like that. Um, which I think maybe helped me stay afloat as a professional telemark skier a little bit longer than if I was just skiing. Um, cause like you said, it's, it's kind of, yeah, for all you kids out there that want to be sponsored, it's not only how good of a skier you are, but it's, it's how you can help that brand, not so much how cool you are. That's a great. Um, way, that's a great way to put it. Yeah, just because you're just because you're a great skier doesn't totally mean that people should be giving you free gear or money. <laughs> it's just, yeah, um, and as someone who has worked as a team manager for a ski company, it definitely goes noticed. The athletes who pick up their paycheck and don't help you a lot with what you ask. And then there's the athletes not getting a paycheck who are driving to a ski demo and helping the local local rep and literally 
sending you emails saying, Hey, what else can I help with? What do you need from me type of thing? So that, that type of stuff does not go unnoticed. I'm so glad you said that, man. Cause literally like hard work really does pay off on in that stuff. And there are a lot of people that just don't do the work. Like eventually they fade out. Usually I'd say in most cases. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, yeah. well, that's right. Yeah. So go ahead. It's kind of a tangent, but to answer your question, (laughs) um, yeah, I got my degree in photography, um, at the university of Colorado at Boulder and my last semester there did a ski ski and skiing magazine internship as a um photographer photography assistant there and then um because i was kind of gallivanting around the country with you on in the in the winters i did four and a half years at college and then was offered a job at ski and skiing magazine when they were both two different magazines, but, but run by the same people and the same editors. Um, so I ended up working as, um, yeah, a photographer's assistant there for about a year and a half, I believe. Yeah, that's, that sounds about right. Should I keep going? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know if you wanted to interject with anything. Um, no, 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 no. I, this is exactly, I was, I, I think it's really interesting, like kind of how you parlayed your athlete stuff into this and then actually got a degree. And, and I just remember like you were always interested in photography. I think at one point you were like, I'm going to be a Nat Geo photographer. And I was like, awesome. You know? Yeah, for, for sure. That was the dream for a while. Um, yeah. And then um, that was, so that, winter working for ski and skiing magazines was kind of my last winter competing. Um, I went to Sweden for a bit with Andreas was helping you out with telemark skier magazine was working at ski and skiing. Um, yeah, just, and that, so that was kind of my full, it, it, it had been like a slow transition between being an athlete and a cameraman and slowly they switched um, more to being a cameraman. And then that year was kind of my final year of being an athlete and just being behind the camera. So um, I believe this was 2015 or 16. I was hired as the uh, photo editor for free skier magazine, which is also in Boulder. Yeah. And yeah, so that was kind of like, I got the taste of it working at skiing skiing and I actually pr- didn't really want to leave there because the people there were so great. I still keep in touch with some of them. Um, the art director is actually going to shoot my wedding next year. So no I way. still keep in. Yeah. Um, Who, that's so not, that I, wasn't Mark. Was that Mark? No, uh, it was Eleanor Williamson. Oh, Eleanor. Okay. I don't know if I knew her. Um, who then worked at Spider for a bit, and now she's kind of on her own doing like wedding stuff. But um, yeah, so I I still keep in touch with the good folks over there. Um, Kevin Luby, by the way, who is a ripping telemark skier. Shout out used to, to work there. Luby's the yeah. man, dude. I was yeah, I've done some trips with Luby. He's a good dude. And then he went on to Scarpa, and now um, I think does a little bit of work with them, but is in a um kind of like his own media company now yeah i believe totally yep um but yeah so moved on to the photo editor at free skier which is a little bit of change of pace more definitely more my style being a younger park skier um and worked with them for uh, i believe a year and a half and then um got an opportunity to move to seattle and i was hired as the team manager the athlete team manager for k2 yeah that and that i remember when you told me that i was like wow i mean it just, honestly the free skier thing i mean all of those were completely respectable awesome positions but then all of a sudden you were the team manager at k2 and i was like wait a second. I was like, so you, you were literally like Seth Morrison's team manager, correct? And a bunch of those cats. 
Uh, uh yeah, I was actually the one that uh had to fire Seth Morrison from K two. <laughs> And uh, Andy Mayer. So that was that, sucks, that was dude. definitely the worst day of my career probably ever, especially because I grew up loving both of those skiers. And just the way it wasn't like as easy as, hey, I'm calling to tell you this. You know, we have to let you go. It was a bunch of corporate BS that left Seth and Andy in the dark which they ended up being mad at me for and uh, have I've since apologized personally, but I was kind of the pawn in the corporate scheme. And I definitely, um, left how it all worked out, left bad tastes, um, in both of their mouths, especially Seth's. So, that must um, have, yeah, that I was, I was that guy who, <laughs> oh, you know, man. when the news broke that Seth Morrison had been dropped from K2, that was, uh, that was my, not my decision, but it was my doing. Yeah. I don't even know if it's your doing. That's, that's interesting to hear your, yeah, I didn't, I, I kind of spaced that part of it. I was like almost thinking like, wow, rad position. Like you're in charge of all these like awesome guys, but that must've been that must be crazy, man. I mean, that that does give you like a weird window into um, cor- the corporatization of skiing, you know? I mean... For sure. I, I, where do you think that's going? Because I, I always try to explain to people, uh, you know, because everyone, you know, it always goes back to like, Madsen, Telemark's dead. Telemark's dead. And I'm like, actually, I think we're in a good position because we actually are staying within the realm of, you know, like we're telling our skiers we're an outdoor brand and we do that. And what I worry about is people not realizing that, you know, like K2 and that's a great example. Cause you were probably like these, these companies are not owned by outdoor companies. They're owned by much, much larger corporations where the outdoor yep. companies are literally like small change in the bigger holding company you know for sure so it's like oh, it's um, kind of scary because were you there when they almost killed k2 or was that was or were you there after that when uh, Jar, jardin was gonna sell off like five brands it was like marker k2 full tilt i don't know if you were there or not that was um i started right after that so there was it was newell companies which then they also own like crock pot and like oh, holiday the- candle and all these weird so yeah to, to your point it's like to us a big corporation like k2 or marker vocal dalbello they're like you know they're big guns they're part of the the big five or the big six but to the, a company like that also owns crock pot and things like that you're just a tiny little company that makes them a tiny bit of profit and they don't really care about you yeah i mean yeah having been someone who's worked there because that's always been my perception as i'm like i actually you know for as much shit as i talk on alpine ski because i'm a telemark skier and it's you know it's like whatever age-old rival rivalry i still feel for those brands in the sense that they it almost seems like those brands are not in control of their future anymore. And yeah, like literally if an accounting guy decides like these brands, like if you're comparing, like you said, and I think it was Newell, I think I misspoke and said Jardin, which is another well, massive corporation, but um, yeah, it's yeah, like I you said, if Jardin you, used to own Jardin used to own K2 before that. Oh, okay. Yeah. And, and it probably gets so. passed around, but that like, yeah. li- to your point, it's like, if you're if you're a numbers, I mean business is business. So if you're a numbers guy and you're literally comparing the success of like Rubbermaid or Crockpot or whatever, you know, you're selling at Walmart in like mass mm-hmm. volume to like skis that you're selling, which is a small percentage of the population, it right. sk- skiing looks bad at that point because you're not looking at skiing within skiing. <laughs> you're looking at skiing versus, you know, like a Tupper, rubber made Tupperware products. Yeah. And like that, yeah. that's what scares, sure. scares me. Cause I'm like, man, here's these historic brands that could easily get put on the chopping block. And like the guy that kills it is not even going to think twice, you know? 
Right. And then what what was a big eye opener to me was not only what we've been talking about where you know it it can be an accountant saying, "Oh, yeah, no that doesn't make sense. Sell the brand type of thing." Um but also how so when that Newell conglomerate or K2 Outdoor conglomerate is, you know, like K2 ski, K2 snowboard, ride k2 inline skate bca atlas and tub snowshoes mad shoes so it's all we're all kind of grouped oh a line and full tilt is in there as well um w- that's kind of how we're all grouped together and then to see like huge brands like like mad shoes like they just or like k2 skate which you know not a lot of people are interested anymore, but it also still is a big brand in that industry, but just the amount or the lack of amount of support that those brands get, but still survive is like amazing, unbelievable to me. So like even just working with the engineers, you know, who make, you know, the BCA float packs or, um, you know, the, the one person who did marketing in the U S for mad shoes. So it's like, it's just amazing to me that the amazing products and brands that they have and what little support they, they get or receive from, you know, the, the uppers, the, the people who make all the decisions. Yeah. Yeah, no, that is, that is pretty incredible. I mean, what do you, do you think it'll continue to be that way or do you think at some point like more independent brands will start happening again you know because that's that was that was always my fear you know like uh, you know on my podcast and my shop and i you know i you know me dude i'm like mr loyalist you know that's just like Mm -hmm. that's my style but i've always said that telemark really needs its own industry in terms of like small brands making stuff but you know, you're not talking massive growth and people are always like, no, we need to get like K2 back in the game. And I'm like, that is a terrible idea, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Like, but yeah, what for even, for, even for Alpine and all these other things, I mean, do you think at some point they just get chopped and like skiing becomes more independent again? Or what do you think will happen with that? I mean, I'm not entirely sure just because obviously we're skiing and this isn't like the ski industry of like ski movies and magazines. It's more of like the tourist activity of skiing because that is what sends the dollars to people who work in the ski industry. And that is on a weird, it's on a weird path that no one knows where it's going because of, you know, climate change and, viruses where people can't travel um so it's it and it it weirdly depends mostly on that and that is just so up in the air or being juggled by people that are still trying to make a buck um that i you know my instincts would say that things would be sold off and kind of sell you know the big conglomerates like i said like the k2 ski snowboard ride line full tilt all that would start splitting up but then they um i believe the company that then bought k2 sports after that kohlberg holdings combined they took all of those and also combined them with marker dalbello uh vocal so they went the opposite way which you know in one sense makes sense because if you have, you know, multiple people working on multiple brands, you can save money, whether that's in accounting or HR or marketing or whatever. Um, but you know, it could also go the other way where someone like that looks at, let's say Atlas and tub snowshoes. And they say, you know, that's not churning the profit we need. Let's sell it off to either this employee if it's super small or you know this smaller outdoor company um but the way of the world these days are you know mergers and closings so you know we see brands like black diamond which used to be a small climbing company now 
own things like peeps, which is a whole other thing we could get into. But, um, you know, they just kind of get their their venture capital and they expand by by eating up these littler brands that can kind of add to their portfolio. Um, yeah, so I mean, it can go either way. Um, but it's, I say almost possible, impossible to figure it out. Yeah. No, there's a lot of, a lot of variables. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your ideas on that. I, yeah, I mean, you've been in this, yeah, this crazy world that's outside of that, you know, or outside of where I've been. I I've never been in that Mm -hmm. corporate level ski, uh, thing. I've seen telemark, you know, like when they bought line, line car who how they ate car who up but uh, that's kind of the limit of what i've seen happen you know so oh Mm -hmm. crazy well yeah so i mean now nowadays you're uh i mean you've you've done some pretty cool stuff in the ski biz dude and then quick mention you did mention norway you moved to norway you uh did Mm -hmm. marketing and sales for moonlight mountain gear for a couple years yes yeah that was awesome where did you live up there? Not to go too deep into that, but I, I remember yeah. you saying, Hey, I'm moving to Norway and I'm like, where? And you like sent me a map of where you lived. And I'm like, really? <laughs> it's like, you're pretty, yeah. you're pretty far North, I think. Right. For sure. Um, yeah. When I was let go from K2, um, I did the whole, like, I'm getting out of the ski industry thing. I slept on a friend's couch in New York, um, for like a month trying to find a job there slept on a friend's couch in San Francisco for like a month trying to find a job there. And then one day I logged into Facebook and, uh, Bjark Holovic from Moonlight Mountain Gear. And he, I had met him previously at a ski demo in Italy and he had just posted that he's looking for like a content creator and marketing guy for Moonlight. And so I sent him a message saying, you know, I'm super interested if I get a move to Norway and he's like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think he, he told me about five minutes into the conversation that the job was mine, <laughs> which is hilarious, but <laughs> you're hired. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I, then I think it was a couple weeks later, I moved to Burfjord, Norway, which is on the 70th parallel North. So that's equivalent with the, um, the very top tip of Alaska, like wow. Prudhoe Bay. Um, it's about halfway up Greenland and fully north of Iceland. Wow. Epic. So it's, it's definitely up there. I mean, I moved there on a whim just thinking like, I don't have anything holding me back. Why shouldn't I move to Norway <laughs> with a, a ski bag and a roller bag? That sounds smart, <laughs> That's amazing. which is only, yeah, you know what? A, 26 27 year old thinks is a great idea which it it was to be honest i think i got lucky um but yeah i so i lived up north in burfjord working with bjarta um for about a year and then i moved to oslo um when was that 2018 or 19 yeah i moved to oslo and actually my roommate was, um, I'm, I'm not sure if Telemark's years are known, but his, his name's, uh, Luke Ocho Allen. Um, Ocho as his friends call him, but he was Ocho? the, yeah. So he helped start, he helped Mike Weishi start RMU. Yeah. Or I'm, I'm not sure like how much, but I know that he's like a small investor in there, but he was also the Norwegian free ski team head coach. I didn't realize you time. lived with Ocho. Yeah, I used to water ramp with Ocho back in the day. Yeah, a long time yeah, ago. Yeah, and for all those who who know him, he's the man. But um, yeah, he was my roommate in Oslo. Um, so it was kind of like two Americans in the ski industry living living in Norway in Oslo, which is pretty hilarious. But um, yeah, so worked um, with Bjarta, and he had also hired three other guys. Um, one from sweden one from finland and one from italy um who were telemark skiers and or schemo racers to you know help sales and development of not only like 
are the lightweight skis and the lightweight telemark binding, but also the headlamps, which was a big selling point, um, almost more so than, than the telemark binding. But, um, yeah, I mean, for those of you that follow telemark racing or anything on the European side, like Julian Giacomelli was the guy from Italy who, uh, an incredible telemark skier, not only, has he done the racing? He's also a certified maestro de sci in Telemark in Italy mm. and just all around amazing skier. And then um, Jorma, who was the engineer from Finland, um, also a great Telemark skier. Um, but so it was, it was nice that he was not only he was hiring like a lot of talent to, to surround him um, and kind of get, get his product out there. Yeah, that's so. And cool. for those of you that haven't tried it, it's they're unbelievable products. Um, you know, they're making 120 millimeter skis underfoot that are like 1200, 1400 grams per ski, which is insane. Um, they're weirdly durable for how light they are. Um, and I'm not just saying this because I used to do marketing for them. I actually really believed in the product when I worked there. Um, and then, you know, their, um, lightweight telemark binding that has like the, the tele tech toe. Um, and then the lamps are also, the headlamps are mind blowing as well up to, to 10,000 or I think 12,000 lumen they're up to now, which is more than you'll ever need. So <laughs> yeah, those headlamps are insane, dude. They're, yeah. they're crazy. Those skis are amazing too. Like though you brought some over to Utah once and, uh, they really are like the, how they ski versus the weight you know usually like lightweight skis i'm like eh. i'm like the bah humbug like if they're too light they just i feel like they get bounced around um mm -hmm. but those those were amazing yeah so good stuff from moonlight they're a little harder to find in the states but uh yeah if you're in europe definitely check that check that stuff out yeah they're definitely a little harder to try um in the u.s but um, you know, if you're interested, I know they ship international if, if you're buying, but yeah. And, and I, this is the whole thing we went through. There was trying to get how to get people in the U S to try the skis, um, uh, because they are, yeah, like you said, pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah. That's cool. Dude, you've had quite the life, man. It's, it's kind of fun, like going back over 16 years of knowing you and, and literally from that first funny little resume you sent at 14 years old to everything you've accomplished yeah. man congratulations <laughs> it's yeah thank you it's pretty yeah no it's phenomenal it's it's great and it's fun to like talk over it and just go wow man you really have seen some crazy stuff and you've been involved with some stuff you know um and and seen it from like the smallest like you know the van stuff all the way to like working in corporate ski world and living in another country that's uh that's wild dude so and, and you're doing your own uh you got your own little marketing business now, right? Um, I was doing that for a while. Um, I actually, in March, literally, like as the COVID pandemic was hitting, the U.S. was hired. Um, so now I'm the director of marketing for a sunscreen and skincare company here in Minnesota. Oh, sweet. Okay, cool. So uh, I I it's did. called Aloe Up. It's like, it's actually in a lot of ski resorts like it's a more of a higher end sunscreen but um it's aloe based and natural and a little bit i mean not super into the telemark world um would it really be marketed at but it's it's like an outdoor sunscreen that's that's aloe based so yeah that's i love it there's my spiel <laughs> good i like the elevator <laughs> pitch. Marketing, even if i'm on a phone call about telemark. <laughs> you gotta plug it somehow dude um yep. well hopefully we can meet up um We'll we'll see how the traveling goes this winter. It's uh like you said, it's a little bit unknown at this point. But um, we're gonna we just announced we're actually gonna have like a little uh free heel life extension rental fleet uh, up in the UP and uh or oh, up, cool. upper Wisconsin, I guess to be more okay. specific and and one and uh certified free heel life ski tech dude. So we're uh, oh yeah we're gonna we're gonna inch our way over to your zone and. Uh, good chance that some of the crew is going to be out at Midwest Telefest if it uh if it all goes down 
go for sure. go hide in the UP. Maybe we'll drag you up for some some turns at the at the Porkies or up at uh, yeah. Bohemia or something. I have something horrible to admit. I still have my NTN boots, but I have unmounted my last pair of Telmark skis. So I need to. I still have the bindings, but I need to find another pair of skis. I got you, dude. I'll take care of you. Yeah. I'll I mean, being in the Midwest, I n- not only are my touring skis uh, sitting still, but um, it's just been my park skis recently, and I've been alpining on that, so that's a little different. But whatever. I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a center mounted pair of skis, and we're gonna go hit Buck Hill together. So heck yeah, <laughs> that's my that was my stomping ground. I know, I know. So. I saw a picture of you at Buck Hill, and I was like, <laughs> all right, yeah, we got to get there. We'll go jams do some old man yeah. ra- rail jam or something 800 feet of vertical baby see you can that's perfect it's perfect <laughs> <laughs> uh all right buddy dude so good catching up thanks for making time for for the podcast and and uh for sure sharing your stories man i think we covered a ton of ground and uh hopefully hopefully people will be psyched i i think you've got a really unique perspective on coming from the telemark world and just uh yeah it's just good to talk to you man i I don't call you enough so it's good to catch up yeah no i uh i appreciate the call and glad we could kind of rap about things back and forth and uh yeah i mean i I probably didn't say it enough but a a huge part of my quote-unquote success in the ski industry was was a lot in part thanks to you so you know you had as much to do with my journey as i did so oh thanks man well i i appreciate you getting in a creepy van and driving around with me and all my (laughs) crazy ideas i uh i also look back and think it's you know just being like you said you kept kind of going back to you know when we're younger and like how how we look at stuff and it's it's fun to be older and look back and I'm like, wow, I don't even know how we did all that stuff. You know, like (laughs) we just, and honestly, a lot of it was just like a group of us that actually kind of, you know, not to be too cheesy, but you know, it's like we kind of believed in an idea at least or thought it'd be fun and we just went and did it. And I think a lot of people don't do that. And it leads to good things sometimes when you just get in the van and go. (laughs) So, Awesome, man. Well, I'm sure uh, I'm sure we'll get out and do some skiing sooner than later. Hopefully, once this COVID thing kind of shits the bed and we can move on. So, yeah, we can get up to the UP and hit up Midwest Telefast, Mount Bohemia. Oh those, yeah. We'll for do- those of you that haven't skied Mount Bohemia in the UP of Michigan, it is. And this is coming from someone who grew up skiing the Rockies. the The terrain at Mount Bohemia is the real deal for the Midwest. I love that. I uh, see. I haven't so, skied it yet either. That's my little shout out. I know. I need to get up there with you. I, there's some... JT Robinson. I know will will back me up on that. Oh yeah, he's he's planning on heading there this year. So there's there's definitely a cr- a crew that goes up there regularly. Yeah, that's awesome. All right, buddy. Well, I'll let you go. Ha- have a have an awesome weekend and and thanks for uh thanks for chatting. Yeah, for sure, Josh. I appreciate your call. Talk to you soon. Take it easy. Peace. See ya. I love those ones where I can go down memory lane and uh, catch up with old friends. It's man, it's crazy just like how much time flies by. Uh, I feel like that's. I, I say that every time I'm talking to people that I've been kind of on this telemark journey with, but Shell's one of those guys that truly it's been really fun. Just like as a friend and colleague to just kind of like watch where he came from and all the cool stuff that he's been able to do in the ski business. And, uh, he's a unique character in that way. And I think that's, that was a big portion of why I wanted to have him on is just that unique perspective of, you know, just being a a kid and you want to make edits and, you know, get sponsored and get some free gear. And, you know, he really put a lot of hard work and, uh, you know, making that into something and, and networking and kind of, you know, um, it just putting in the work, like he said, and I was so glad he talked about that. Cause a lot of people think, Oh, I'm just, I'm a, I'm a great telemark skier and I'm going to get, you know, people should give me stuff, you know? And it just, you know, I'm glad he f- reflected on that a little bit, you know, having worked at, you know, one of the biggest ski brands in the world, you know, it's just not like that, but also his perspective on, how he was able to take opportunities and kind of roll them into new opportunities and so forth. And, 
he deserves everything he got and has gotten, you know, over the years working and, and just, uh, yeah. So cool to just rap about that. And some funny stuff about the, the volet straps and man, some of those trips were wild. I, I've almost, it's kind of a blur to be honest with you. Some, some days I kind of forget all the stuff we did. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's hard to keep track of it all. It goes by so fast. But anyways, thanks for listening, you guys. I hope you enjoyed uh, checking out the podcast today. I had a great time talking uh, to my old buddy, and hopefully you guys uh, learned something too. And uh, as always, you can always support the podcast directly by making a donation of your choice to paypal.me slash Uh We are up and rolling hardcore at the shop these days. Thank you so much for your support. If you're shopping with us, we are ever so grateful. It's unbelievable to see the amount of support we've gotten this season. And it's just, it's crazy. I don't even know how to, some days we just sit there and, and uh, me, Taylor and Ashley will, will talk about where we started in the first year and where it's at now. And it's, incredibly hard to believe and it wouldn't happen if it wasn't for all of you out there supporting the shop and helping us by purchasing your gear uh at free heel life so if you're not in salt lake you can go to or or wherever you're at you can go freeheellife.com we'd love to be your preferred telemark shop uh as far as finding articles and more information telemark gear magazine is found at telemarkskier.com uh youtube videos how-to videos everything kind of merges on the youtube channel find us there all of social media at free hill life at telemarks or at telly skier mag tons of stuff we're really we're finally the content machines up and rolling we got a, a really good crew putting stuff together and if you have ideas of stuff that you need to see, feel free to message us, customer service at freehealife.com, and we're happy to help you with all your telemark needs. You can email me direct at podcast at freehealife.com. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Let me know if you're digging the episodes. If there's someone I need to get on the radar, I've got a long running list of people, and I'm always happy to put them on there and always looking for interesting stories and knowing what's going on out there. Much love, everyone. I hope you guys have a fantastic week. And we'll be back again next Monday with another Free Heal Life podcast. So until then, spend every waking hour spreading telemark. And we'll talk to you next Monday. See you later.